Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. I appreciate everybody being here for our Travel Reward Travel Rewards Q and A with Brad Barrett. I am Nick Minix, the Associate Director of Digital Strategy and Engagement for Alumni Engagement at University of Richmond. I had the chance to attend one of Brad's Choose FI workshops back when I was working at the Business School a few years ago. And during that session, I noticed a significant interest in his travel rewards tips. And so while I was reflecting on New Year's resolutions and considering bucket list travel, I thought it would be a perfect opportunity to give um, alumni the chance to tap into Brad's wealth of knowledge. So Brad Barrett is a University of Richmond graduate from the class of 2001. He's the co-founder and co-host of Choose FI, a comprehensive platform providing podcasts, blogs, and videos for the financial independence community. Having initially pursued a career in public accounting as a CPA, Brad achieved financial independence at the age of 35 through dedicated savings and strategic investing. Brad's enthusiasm extends across various realms from frugal living and promoting a healthier lifestyle to seemingly mundane tasks like financial tracking and tax optimization. However, his favorite topic is leveraging credit card rewards to not only save money, but also unlock incredible travel experiences at a fraction of the cost. In a moment, I'll hand it over to Brad, but before I dive in, I wanted to give everyone a quick reminder. Today's Zoom session is being recorded and will be uploaded to the University of Richmond Alumni Engagement YouTube channel. If feasible, we'd love for you to join us on camera. To minimize background disturbances, though, please kindly keep your microphone muted when you're not actively participating or asking questions. When you're ready to ask a question, feel free to unmute yourself. Additionally, you can use the raise hand uh, reaction to be acknowledged, or you can also engage with us through the chat feature throughout today's. So I will go ahead and let Brad take it from here. All right. Nick, thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. This should be a lot of fun. And yeah, for everybody out there, definitely feel free to unmute yourself, use the chat feature to ask questions, share your thoughts. This really is going to be an, an introduction to travel rewards, but obviously if you have specific questions, I'm happy to field them and, and we'll see how deep down the rabbit hole we can go potentially or, or send you off to other areas of the internet to, uh, to find some answers. I think uh, it, this is cool actually because uh, as Nick said, I have a podcast called Choose FI, which is financial independence. So choose financial independence. And uh, I don't spend that much time talking about travel rewards anymore. And this is my my initial love. So uh, it's it's neat to get to speak to U of R alum about it. And yeah, I mean, I basically over the last roughly 10 years have I guess earned somewhere in the vicinity of probably about three million points and miles, which uh, by Nick's face is uh, is kind of uh, pretty an amazing an amazing number. It really I kind of value them roughly at two cents per point, so that's somewhere in the vicinity of sixty thousand dollars worth of free travel, and basically. It's by the largest portion of this strategy is opening very targeted credit cards and earning these massive signup bonuses. So I think Nick had sent out a whole bunch of links. Hopefully a lot of you did your uh, quote unquote homework, but uh, if not, I wanted to give just a, a quick, quick overview. So obviously it goes without saying tens of millions of people get into credit card issues, debt, et cetera. Uh, if that is even remotely you, please run as far and as fast as you can from this. This is this is not for you. But if you're like me and my family who pretty much uses their credit card for all of our life expenses, more or less, and we pay it off on time and in full every single month. And I mean, we used to be pretty happy with, let's say, our 1% cash back or one and a half or whatever it may be. And, you know, that seemed like a win until I found this people call it travel hacking. I kind of, I, I don't love that term. So I just call it maximizing travel rewards. And basically it's opening these very targeted credit cards to earn these bonuses and then more or less moving on to a new credit card and accumulating that bonus. And that's how certainly in the early years, I was able to open dozens upon dozens of these cards to the bank's great credit. It's become a lot harder in recent years. And uh, nobody's trying to spam anybody or doing it, do anything untoward. We're obviously just following the credit card company's rules and opening these cards if we get approved and we earn these bonuses, which you can really turn into 
something significant. And I think really the the way that we, the springboard for us was a three generation family trip to Disney World, actually. And that's kind of how I was put on the map, I guess, in the, the online world where we got featured in a, a really significant New York Times article. And uh, I mean, basically my family, my parents and my in-laws, we all went to Disney World. I think between the eight of us, it was cost about $300 if memory serves. And it probably would have cost about 7,000 if, uh, if we had to pay cash. So it's one of these things where there's no, okay, I need to travel next month. Can I just quickly do this? It, it, it doesn't exactly work like that. It's, can I strategize? Can I plan six, 12, 18 months ahead of time, open up very targeted credit cards and then turn that into nearly free travel? I think that from a real 30,000 foot view, uh, no pun intended, is uh, really how we're how we're going about this. So uh, again, that's that's just the really quick overview. So Nick, hopefully that was a, a good starting point. I don't know if you have any uh, questions. I know you've been listening to podcasts and uh, going down the rabbit hole lately. I have. And actually what you just said uh, will bring up the first question. So if someone is like me planning a trip for either later this fall or this winter, is it too late to use these strategies to benefit for that trip? Or would it be better just to bank any points and save them for like the next trip? Yeah. So later this fall, uh, I would say you pr most likely still have time. Uh, and I think the really nice part about travel rewards is there are always ways to win. There's always ways to save. It's just a question of, is it perfectly optimal? And I would argue, we just want to travel, right? Like don't let perfectly optimal be the enemy of, of, of the good here, I guess. And so for instance, even just worst case scenario, a card like the Capital One Venture card, or they have a Venture X, which is another version of it, you could literally open that card. I don't know exactly what the sign up bonus is on the, the venture. It's probably 40 or 50,000 points. So uh, let's say just hypothetically, it's 50,000 points. You could literally open that card today. The card would show up in a couple of days. You can actually purchase your travel as part of that minimum spending requirement. And for everybody listening, the minimum spend is basically the stipulation that comes with that sign up bonus. So let's say, again, hypothetically, I'm making this up. It's 50,000 points when you spend $3,000 in the first three months. Okay. That's fairly typical language. You'll see something like that. So that's you earn that bonus, that 50,000 point bonus, when you hit that cumulative spending amount of, in this case, $3,000. Okay. Now, that does not mean you're carrying a balance. You're not paying any interest expense, not, nothing like this. You're paying it off on time and in full every single month. So it's once you get to that cumulative 3000, then that triggers the bonus at the, usually at the end of that statement balance. I think in the case, I think in the case of the Capital One Venture, it might be actually when you hit that 3000, but don't quote me on that. But uh, for instance, Nick, to actually answer your question is a card like the Venture, you can pay for that travel with that credit card as part of that first 3000. So you don't even have your points. They haven't, the bonus hasn't hit. And once you get the bonus points, you can actually retroactively apply them against that travel in the last, I think it's the last 90 days. So by definition, if, if we're saying it's a three month uh, sign up, you know, it's three month spend period, by definition, it will be in that last 90, 90 days. Right. So uh, that's actually just a real simple way, again, in our hypothetical example to save $500. So that's nothing to sneeze at, right? Is $500. Yeah. I think in the travel rewards world, we think of, oh man, I want to fly for free first class. I want to stay in a beautiful Hyatt suite or a park Hyatt somewhere. But let's be honest, like most of us are pretty darn happy saving 500 bucks for just being smart financially, basically. So, um, and then there are obviously other examples of you could open a card. I know you just opened uh a Chase Sapphire Preferred, which is is generally my first recommended card. And uh, if you hit the spend bonus pretty quick and those points then are sitting in your Chase account, uh, and I don't know how deep you want me to get here on, on Chase, but this it might be worth the sidebar here is we love those uh, transferable points, they're called. So uh, generally considered like bank points. So Chase Ultimate Rewards 
Amex membership rewards. Many people are familiar with those from the, the gold card, the platinum card. Uh, actually, Capital One Venture Miles are now transferable. But really, Chase Ultimate Rewards are my favorite because they live in your Chase credit card account. Okay, so let's say you earn that bonus of 60,000 points, you spent on it, and you have 70,000 miles, let's say, or 70,000 Chase Ultimate Rewards points. Those live in your credit card account. And at any given moment, I think they have, it's a roughly a dozen transfer partners. It might be 12, 13, 14, somewhere in that vicinity, where you can transfer any of those points to those transfer partners and they become points and miles in that program. So for instance, I actually I actually just had a fun win yesterday that maybe we can talk about, uh, you know, since I'm being a little long-winded here, but we can talk about it later, was I am taking a trip to Texas with my daughter. She's a big roller coaster fan. So we're going, going to Texas next month. And I was able to transfer Chase Ultimate Rewards points to Hyatt because that's one of their transfer partners. And I was able to get a room there in, I think it was 5,000 points a night in Dallas and only 8,000 points a night in San Antonio. So for a four-night trip, it was 29,000 points. And that got us four free nights that probably would have been about $600 in cash. That felt like a nice, a nice little win to me. And I could have transferred the remaining points to United or British Airways, that's a little a, a little more in, in depth. And Nick, that's my win, as you certainly know. But um, or Southwest, which is another great option. So that's why I like points like those chase points, because there's so much flexibility. You can just transfer them to all these different places. And so yeah, the the short answer, Nick, is hey, if you're going this fall or this or later this winter, early next year, you can definitely save. There's no question about it. Awesome. I'll see. I'll wait and see if anybody else wants to come off mute. I definitely have more questions, but I don't want to, to hog. <laughs> okay. Um, what specific tools or tracking methods do you recommend to stay organized? Um, and I know that um, from listening, but you can share with the group too. Uh, travel freely. I did sign up for that as well. Nice. Um, but I was thinking, are there any cool AI tools that might have been um, developed recently to either help you track your points or to help you find the cheaper flights, the rental cars, the hotel stays? Yeah, that is a great question. So I am trying to call this up while we're talking here. Um, the Website that I find to be uh, the most helpful generally. So yeah, like you mentioned, Travel Freely is a great way to track your credit cards. Uh, there's a website called Award Wallet. So awardwallet.com. Uh, interestingly, the guy who's the editor-in-chief there, I've known for 10 years, going back to when he, I literally taught him travel rewards, which is crazy. And now he's one of the most knowledgeable people in the entire like worldwide industry of this, uh, their blog is fantastic. I think, frankly, if you wanted to learn travel awards, you can just go to Award Wallet's blog. But they also have, and I obviously have no affiliation with them whatsoever. But uh, you can create a free login, and it as their their uh, front page of the website, all your rewards and travel in one place. So it tracks all your credit cards, loyalty points, travel plans, etc. That's just a fantastic site. They're, they're, it's hard to go wrong with Award Wallet. There's another website called point.me. So point.me. And I think they allow you to search. They're like a search tool. And I think I suspect they're at they're at the cutting edge from what I've heard from from my friends who are really, really knowledgeable with us. Uh they are at the absolute cutting edge of this. So AI. I don't know specifically, but I would be shocked if they were not implementing this because they're they're always really at the cutting edge. And I guess uh, one tool, I think what really gets, what makes this difficult for people is fear that they're not going to be able to use their, their points and miles. They're not going to be able to redeem them. You always hear these horror stories of, of blackout dates. I think like largely it's a misunderstanding of what award availability actually is. But frankly, at the end of the day, nobody really cares if it's uh, if it's a true blackout date or if it's just 
hey, there are tens of millions of people with points and miles and they book those award seats quicker than you, right? Like, I think realistically, that's that's what most blackout dates look like are there's a finite number of seats available on each flight and people book these things. So uh, that said, if you want to uh, have a professional do this for you, a somebody who actually writes for me at my website, travelmiles101.com, uh, he has a website called boundlessmiles.com. So boundlessmiles.com. His name is Dominic and he is like a real world expert in this. And he charges a fraction of what other, these are called award booking services. Uh, so basically you tell him where you want to go. You tell him what points you have. And he literally goes and searches using all his knowledge, skills, et cetera. And he can even like literally book it for you. Though I, I suspect you'd probably do it yourself. But uh, yeah, that's a, and it, it's very reasonable. I forgot it precisely, but I think it's like $50 or something like that. Whereas as compared with, other services cost a hundred or two hundred per ticket. So, uh, yeah, highly, highly recommend. So, yeah, award wallet, point at me, and boundless miles. Those would be my three. Awesome, great, thank you. And I'll pause for just a moment. Okay. Um. So, okay. So, with the uh specifically, but just in generally, with a, a credit card, when you open it up and you've met, you opened it up specifically so that you could get the the award points yep. at the end of, and you've met your minimum spend. Is there ongoing value to continue using that card, or would you switch back to a cash back card, or would you just move down the list to the next preferred travel rewards card? Yeah, yeah, that is a a really great question. So, I personally would go to the next card that I'm looking to open. Now, obviously everybody has a different comfort level of of how really how comfortable they are in, in opening credit cards, how far down this they want to go. So, I mean, there's a case to be made for virtually any option, but yeah, I mean, if you're looking to really, if you're getting started with this, you haven't opened any credit cards. There are some, like I said before, the banks to their great credit have made this a lot more difficult. I mean, the wild, wild west days of 10 years ago, which, uh, you know, doesn't sound all that far off, but you used to be able to open cards by the dozen. And now that's, that has become virtually impossible, but you can still accumulate, I mean, hundreds of thousands of points. I think very simply, you could easily take one to two free or close to free vacations every year with enough planning. So... Yeah, I mean, I guess, Nick, to, to put it in, in monetary terms, I would argue that, you know, if you're used to 1% or 1.5%, 2% even is probably the best you can do. I think the the Fidelity Visa card is, is 2%. Some other cards are roughly around 2%. So, I mean, that's basically the best you can possibly do with normal cashback or just rewards. Most of these cases... Let's say, let's say for argument's sake, using our example from before, the 50,000 miles when you spend $3,000 in the first three months, okay? So normally, you are you spend $3,000. If you had even 2% back, we're talking, what, $60, right? So $60 is what the, the normal floor would be on this. Now, if you got 50,000 miles and you turn that into... I usually use that back of the envelope of two cents per point. So 50,000 miles would be a thousand dollars worth of free travel. Now, does that mean every time you're going to get a thousand dollars? No, you might get more, you might get less, but I've found and people in, in this travel awards world has found that that's kind of the, the back of the envelope. So a thousand dollars in free travel for $3,000 of spend. So that's 33%. That's, I mean, remarkable, right? So, uh, and it, it is truly remarkable, but it's not unusual because that's just how this works. So there's simply no way that you're going to get even a fraction of the value just going back to your old card. So again, you have to do what works for you. But I think if you're if you're comfortable opening multiple credit cards, this could potentially be a way to get 15 to 30 percent pretty easily in terms of like a rebate on every dollar you spend on your credit card 
which I don't know about you, but that's basically every dollar I spend in life other than my mortgage. So getting a 15 to 30% rebate on that is not too shabby at all. So uh, yeah, I mean, that's really high level how I, how I think about that. Um, so this one, uh, I have, if, if, if you can't tell, I am, I'm trying to plan that trip for later in the fall. So uh, a lot of my, where are my you going? Are very specific. We're hoping to go to Italy. Ooh, um, nice. So, um, I was looking, um, so Reagan, so I was using uh, some of the higher level where I was looking for, um, like which airports would go, you know, right. there are no the Dallas, like, close to us. Yeah. So nope. it would have to be Reagan to JFK, um, over to Italy. So, and those are through either American Airlines or Delta. So would you recommend signing up for frequent flyer miles for all of One World and all of Sky Team Alliance's partners now? Um, so, okay, hold on. You, cause uh, sorry. I actually <laughs> I want to, uh, I, I want to challenge the premise <laughs> of, uh, of, of your starting point. So okay. I, I, cause uh, I, so you're going to have to repeat the second half of your, your question, but <laughs> so I would actually, it's not Reagan. I would go to, to, Dulles. So Dulles is the international airport. Dulles is a massive. Uh, oh my goodness. What's the. Uh, I think I did see some from Dulles when I was on yeah. the British Airways the other day too. It was like Dullus to Heathrow. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hold on. Give me one second. Sure. Uh, So, right. So Dulles is a major Star Alliance hub because it's United's, United's major hub. So, right. Reagan Airport has no international flights to my knowledge or essentially none. Uh, so, and this is actually, you asked for a tool. Uh, what I do generally when I, when I have a starting point is I go, I look at the Wikipedia page actually to find uh, where, where uh, what, who flies out of that airline, uh, uh, excuse me, out of that airport and where it flies to. So very simply, in this case, I would type into Google Dulles Airport Wiki or IAD Airport Wiki. That's the the three three digit code for Dulles. And you will see, you scroll down in every airport Wikipedia page, there's airlines and destinations. Okay. So an another nice one, since we're here in Richmond is Richmond Airport Wiki. That's just a really good thing to know uh where where you can get direct from your local airport now building flexibility in gen, just in terms of hey how can you win with travel awards is building any type of flexibility in so this is just another high level 30,000 foot view is uh can you build flexibility in with the timing like you want to go to italy if you there there's multiple areas to build flexibility so the departing airport certainly helps the date, if you're not like dead set, it has to be October 17th to October 26th. If it can be, hey, sometime this fall or maybe even early 2025, great, that's going to help. What if it's, we desperately need to go only to Rome and only to Florence in that exact order? Okay, well, that makes it a little more difficult. What if you just said, hey, we want to go to Italy? Well, that makes it a whole lot better still, right? So I think, I mean, honestly, Nick, I would say there's virtually, if you... If you open the Chase Sapphire Preferred and you got that bonus and you got 60,000 plus points, I can't envision a scenario where you couldn't find a round trip award flight to Italy and it just cost you basically nothing, just the taxes and fees, even for this fall. If you were, if you had a lot of flexibility on the time, especially, yeah. I, I mean, I think that's a slam dunk. So uh, any further out in time just makes it even closer to a hundred percent. So, uh, yeah, I mean that, so right. That's the tip is the Wikipedia page is shockingly useful. And when you go to IAD or Dulles airport wiki, you'll see airlines and destinations destinations, and you'll see a massive, massive section at United. Okay. Because that is just a huge United hub. It's also their star Alliance partner. So you'll see a lot of, uh, uh, Lufthansa, and I'm doing this from it's probably Air Canada. Uh, this is always a, a high wire act to uh, talk and Google search at the same time. But uh, yeah, you'll see, yeah, hundreds of United and then just a ton of different uh, 
star line. So anyway, what that means is, and what's cool, and this is another kind of like intermediate uh, understanding of travel awards is when you have points in an alliance partner, you can actually use those points to potentially fly on flights and other alliance partners. So uh, it might, I, how I worded that probably isn't the exact perfect way, but let's say you go to united.com and just from their main homepage, you literally click use miles or redeem miles or whatever it is, and just type in IAD to Rome. And I forget what FCO might be the, yeah. the code there. Uh, well, I, I pulled that out of a 10 year memory. So, <laughs> and then you can just do October or November of 2024, and you can just kind of keep searching. And you're basically looking for 30,000 points. And what's interesting is you'll see almost invariably it not just be United airplanes, even just from the united.com search, you'll see there's their star Alliance partners show up, which is really, really cool. So, uh, by having points in one star Alliance member, you get to use them on other airlines. Now there are some limitations. Certainly usually the airlines only open up when they have like the, what's known as the saver level award tickets. So, uh, it's again with those blackout dates, right? Like it's not technically a blackout, but somebody booked these. So it, it doesn't mean just because uh, Lufthansa flies through from Dulles to Frankfurt and Frankfurt to Rome that you're going to get on every single iteration of that flight. It doesn't work that way. It's, Hey, you have to find availability and you have to find availability at that lowest level. And, but again, if you're flexible, you can do great. So yeah, I mean, in general terms, that's why you want to more or less be able to touch on all three of the main alliances. So it's Star Alliance is, you know, the the uh, United States airline would be United, like I've said repeatedly. One World Alliance is American Airlines and their partners. And then Sky Team is Delta. So pretty much if you have points in those three or have those transferable points that can get you to those three uh, airlines or uh, alliances, I mean, that opens up literally the whole world to you. So yeah, it gives you a lot of options. I feel like too, in one of your podcasts that you mentioned, or maybe it was um, one of your guests mentioned that some of the um, partner airlines require you to have a relationship with them before being able to use their points. So would you recommend opening up, just going ahead and just opening up all the frequent flyers for all the airlines? Yeah, Might as yeah well that's a great question. I, I, there's no downside to it. I know I can tell how excited you are personally about this. Uh, I can say that I have been doing this for a very long time and I don't have like a Finnair account or a Lufthansa account, like, but there's no downside to it. Uh, there's really no downside whatsoever because yeah, I think there are very isolated instances where, yeah, if you don't have an account, you can't transfer points or it has, you have to have some waiting period. It's kind of few and far between, but you know, that said, if you wanted to take an hour and create a free account at 15, 20 different airlines, I mean, Nick, nobody's stopping you. There's no downside to that whatsoever. So, uh, <laughs> great. I think we did have a question come in. Good. So Good Kelly check. asks, is there a best card? Uh, and Gwendolyn, it's the sky team Alliance is, uh, Delta's so sky team, um, that's the, that's the smallest of the three major alliances. Uh, I forget exactly what's I think Korean Air is in there. You can just quickly Google uh, Sky Team Alliance. Um, so best card to choose if you want to go to Europe. Example city is London, Paris, Rome. Okay. So just like anything, it's obviously I'm speaking to multiple people and hopefully, you know, many, many people who are listening to to the uh, the recording of this. So there's no perfect answer because it's always going to depend on what city you live in, what your airport is and, and what options. If, I mean, if your airport had literally zero, if you were, you only had one major international airport and within six hours and you were, it was inconceivable for you to drive past that. And there were only one world Alliance partners there. Well, then I would say, all right, you probably want to stockpile American miles or maybe British Airways miles. And that's uh, a little, those are actually easier to come by than American miles. So it, the starting point really simply is 
the Wikipedia page for your local airport or airports is the starting point. But that said, I've found, and, and since we were talking about, about United, I found personally in my experience, and again, this is a broad generalization, but that, that, uh, the star Alliance is generally the easiest to use to get to Europe. I find, uh, that there are just tons of options and, you know, again, so best card, I, I think it's hard to go wrong with that, the chase Sapphire preferred. I think that for, again, broad generalization, but for 80 plus percent of people, that's going to be your starting point because you're going to, you're going to be sitting on 65, 70,000 points just from the bonus and the minimum spend. And that in a lot of cases, again, with some flexibility is going to get you a round trip to Europe. Now, again, you will see, so two, two quick points, you will see there are always taxes and fees added on now. Interestingly, in the United States, it's only five dollars and sixty cents for a one-way flight. That's the those are the fees we pay the U.S. government. So you'll often see round trip award flight is eleven dollars and twenty cents. Okay, plain and simple. That's it. End of story. That's all you're going to pay. Whenever you fly internationally, you have to pay the taxes and fees that that government requires. All right. So I don't want you to, uh, to be cursing me six months from now when, oh man, this uh, country charged me $172 and that random guy, Brad said it was going to be $5. That's not the way it works. It's every country is different. And I think a lot of people have found that flying into and out of uh, the UK and cer certainly London, I don't want to say into and out of, I think it's only one way, but uh, I haven't done an award search for that in a while. So please don't quote me on that. But just back back of your mind is flying into and out of London is usually going to get hit, get you hit with some significant fees. So that might not be, especially if you want to do a, a Europe trip, maybe you fly into Paris or Rome and fly from Paris to London. And now I think anybody who's been to Europe in the last 20 or 30 years knows you can fly around Europe for virtually zero dollars, right? It's with Ryanair or EasyJet. I think there's some other ones now. I mean, you can literally fly for one way, $20, $30. So uh, you definitely, if, again, if the flexibility allows you, you would want to do that. I think that would be that would be in your benefit. So the nice thing is you can just mock this stuff up, right? Just go just for fun, go to united.com and just see what it looks like. And uh, as you play around and and, I'm not just in the bag for United, obviously that's just, to me, that's the easiest place to start. And I think that's what a lot of us here on the call are looking to do is just get the momentum up to start basically. So, so yeah, that was caveat number one. And the other was uh, just a thought that flittered through my mind was it's very important to know that let's just say, let's say you're married. Okay. Significant other, two adults, whatever, whatever it is, right. Whatever the situation is, every adult can open every single one of these credit cards in their name and social security number. Now it's irrelevant if let's just say I opened a, the Chase Sapphire Preferred and I added my wife as an authorized user. Now there are actually reasons not to do that these days. And Nick, this is important. So I, I will, I will go through this, but, uh, but let's just say hypothetically I did, right? So Laura then would have a Chase Sapphire Preferred in her wallet, but it's under my account. That does not preclude her from opening a Sapphire Preferred in her name and social, okay? So she can then turn around once we've hit the spend, she could open a Sapphire Preferred in her name and social, and we can each get the bonus. So having, they you know, jokingly call it two-player mode, so having a significant other or another adult, it, it doubles the available universe of these cards, basically. So that's something really important to consider. Uh, one thing that is really has become much more important again with these credit cards getting smarter is the credit card companies, excuse me, is chase chase probably has 70% of the top tier travel rewards cards. So you're almost invariably going to be opening a number of chase cards. If you pursue this strategy and they have made what used to be an unofficial rule. I think it's probably official at this point. It's called the 524 rule. So basically, if you have opened 
five credit cards in the last 24 months from any bank, Chase, Capital One, Amex, et cetera, Chase will just summarily reject you. No chance. So you actually have to keep track of, hey, when did I apply for these cards? Because you have this constant rolling 24-month period behind you that you need to be cognizant of. Okay. So this is absolutely critical. Now, the interesting thing, and there, there is some nuance. I would probably suggest if you're getting into this, I would suggest Googling the 525-24 rule for Chase, because there's some like exceptions, which are outside the scope of, of this call, like with business cards and this bank and that bank, but in general terms, 524, and that includes authorized user cards, right? So in my example, if I added my wife, Laura, as an authorized user on my account, that's one ding for her out of those five, which means she can only open four cards in the next 24 months and get four bonuses. So in today's modern travel rewards world, you really don't want to add an authorized user unless you absolutely have to, to hit the minimum spending requirement. That's the only reason you would ever do that. And then therefore you're probably going to start with mostly chase cards because once you hit that 524, it doesn't mean you can't then apply for Amex cards or Capital One, et cetera. So you're probably going to want to, over a period of, of 12 to 18 months, open five chase cards each in all likelihood. So that um, the Travel Freely uh, website that I mentioned earlier, and that's one of your friends too. And he's uh, local here in Richmond too, isn't he? What's so his name? He's not. He's in oh, Nashville. He's but yeah, oh, he's a really, just a guy I met through my podcast and, and such. And he's just wonderful. He's uh, actually, him and his family are living in New Zealand right now, which is oh, amazing. Phenomenal. But uh, yeah, it's wild how <laughs> people, people travel. But uh, yeah, that's a great site. Yeah. So his website, actually, if you... Um, input your credit cards he'll keep and you put in when you open them he'll keep track of the 524 or the website does keeps track of the 524 for you yeah and it's so i mean it's so nice and then yeah you get those email reminders mm -hmm. which just makes life so much easier you don't any any way you can take your brain out of this and make it easier definitely do it i mean i used to just have like an old school excel spreadsheet that i would look at every couple of weeks but yeah it's technology is amazing right <laughs> Um, do you recommend setting up, so you, you mentioned flexibility a lot <clears throat> and I started a, a list of like, okay, well, we want to go here. We want to go here. We want to go here. We really don't care when we go or, you know, in what order. So would you recommend since we have that flexibility of setting up like flight alerts for all the places you want to go, or is that overkill? Would that be too, too yeah. much? No, it's a good question. I, I don't know if that is overkill because, well, that's that's a great question, Nick. You can tell I'm uh, I'm flummoxed <laughs> by it. So, uh, if you are flexible, and yeah, I mean, there's no down, there's there is no downside to that, right? Because it's you have no ordering rules. Yeah, sure, you want to go to Italy, but that could be your fall of twenty five trip, right? So. If something opened up for, hey, we want, we desperately want to go to Japan also, and you found saver level tickets, or even better, you found business class on A and A or J A L or something like, yeah, I mean, it's hard, it's it's hard to talk talk you out of doing that. So, <laughs> um, another podcast that's really really great is a buddy of mine uh, named Chris Hutchins has a podcast called All the Hacks, and actually, interestingly, he had a masterclass on the credit cards that he's using that came out literally today came out this morning. So, uh, that's a great site, a uh, great podcast. His show runs the gamut of just like hacks in every aspect of life, but he has a real love for travel rewards. So, uh, you'll find some, if you're looking to go down, down a rabbit, rabbit hole from somebody who's just so knowledgeable, but is also a normal person. I think in the travel rewards world, you often see like, 24 year old kids like flying Singapore suites first class. And like, there's nothing wrong with that, but I think it's easier to relate, at least for me to somebody like me who has a family and has, you know, a real life and, and a job. So, uh, I've found, yeah, Chris Hutchins to be a really good resource. Great. Um, so you want me to, uh, while you're looking for another another question, you want me to talk about my travel rewards win from yesterday? Oh, yes, please do. Yes. So, 
Yeah, this was this was a good one. So, uh, like I'd mentioned in passing, my older daughter is a roller coaster enthusiast. So she is like a, a absolute addict for roller coasters, and uh, they randomly have two days off from school uh, in in mid to late February. So this is, I mean, a month from now. Now, in again, with flexibility and such, generally you want to, you'd ideally like to book your award flights many months in, in advance because there's a higher likelihood of having award availability, but also sometimes award availability shows up last minute too, which is another neat little thing. So Nick, keep that in the back of your mind, especially if you are super flexible. Uh, so, okay, we were flying into, ideally, we were going to fly into Dallas, Texas, the night of February 16th, after school, and then go to an amusement park in Dallas the next day, then fly to, then drive to San Antonio and stay there for a couple of days. All right. So there was only this one flight into Dallas that would really work for us. That was nonstop the night, that Friday night. And I looked at it and it went, I, somebody must have purchased the, the $300 seat, which is still somewhat unpalatable. And then they were $500 a seat. So literally for a one-way flight from Richmond to Dallas, it, it, it was going to set us back over a thousand dollars. Needless to say, that was, that was not ideal. So I'm thinking about, okay, do we just go, do we cut a park out of this, an amusement park out of this trip? Do we just go the next day? Do what, what are our options? And then I remembered, okay, well, this flight is an American Airlines flight. So it's a direct American Airlines flight from Richmond to Dallas. Now, I am out of American miles. Actually, they're they're pretty hard to come by. And we use them for a trip that we took to the Atlantis uh, this past uh, spring break. So that, you know, kind of famous resort down in the Bahamas. Uh, we actually used Marriott points and got a five-night stay at the Atlantis, which would have been eight or nine hundred dollars a night and it was under a hundred thousand marriott points because they give you the fifth night free which was pretty cool too so um anyway long story short is i realized okay i have a ton of british airways miles and again like i had mentioned earlier that's a one world alliance partner and i figured you know at this point and with that, that how much that flight costs there's not a direct relationship between the price certainly and are there award seats but in general terms if the price is that high it usually means it's pretty popular and they're probably not going to be award seats but i'm like you know what let me check this out so i went over to british airways logged in ran the search and they said five saver level tickets available so i was able to use i've, I've had these british airways miles for seven years and I, I i've been slowly whittling them down but i still have a lot of them and I was able to use under 30,000 miles. I think it was like, I think it was 28,000. And it cost me, like I said, $11.20 each. Oh no, excuse me, $5.60 each. So $11.20 total. And we got this, what would have cost us over $1,000 for 28, 29,000 British Airways miles, which was awesome. So, I mean, that's a, a three cent plus per, uh, three cents per point or more. In, in value, which is really fantastic. So, I mean, Nick, that, that saved yeah. our whole trip right there. And it was, it was great. Like I said, we used the Hyatt points from Chase, transferred those over. I could have actually transferred Chase points to British Airways as well, because British Airways is uh, one of the Chase transfer partners. So, I mean, literally just by having Chase points, I could have taken this trip and for virtually zero dollars so that was uh that was a really really nice one so it was a two thousand dollar trip with my daughter that was just a spur of the moment kind of thing and it, it's costing me virtually zero that's amazing um so someone we have a question it's uh what is the impact to your credit score if you open and close all these cards yeah so right this and and let's be clear i am like the you know, I guess head of the the largest financial independence community in the entire world. I'm a CPA. I, you know, went to U of R business school, like being financially responsible is the most important thing to me. So I'm not arguing for people to do anything crazy here. Obviously you have to do your own research, figure it out. But that said, I have, as, as I've described repeatedly, been doing this for 10 years. I've opened dozens upon dozens of credit cards and my credit score, when I started this, Endeavor about a decade ago was 797. I remember that's seared in my brain. And I think I just logged into my 
Capital One because they give a free credit score. I think it's 824 now. So my credit score has gone up roughly 27 points. My wife is the same. I mean, I have helped, I mean, literally at this point, tens upon tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people do this. And I have yet to find that one person, even one person who wrote back to me saying, Brad, you ruined my life. My credit score went down 50 points or a hundred points. So I couldn't get that mortgage. Like it, it just doesn't seem to happen. Now, obviously, again, you have to do your research. This is not financial advice, all those the ridiculous disclaimers. But what happens practically is when you apply for a credit card, there's it, it's like a hard pull, as it's called, on your on your credit report. And you'll generally see a two to five point reduction in your credit score. I mean, honestly, the credit score, the credit score is so fluid that it it changes so like you're probably not even gonna see it, frankly, or not see it that clearly, but in general terms, two to five points. But almost invariably, that score is gonna pop right back up. And another major factor in your credit score is credit utilization. So actually, interestingly, by having the the denominator has just been increased fairly significantly at that, it actually makes that aspect of your credit score more favorable. So it usually nets out to the positive even within a couple of weeks and certainly within a couple of months. I, I cannot recollect a time where my credit score went down and stayed down for any period of time that was more than a couple of months. So, um, you know, again, that's my personal experience. That's my wife's experience. That's all the people in my extended family. And again, I've yet to find that one person who's written back to me saying my credit score plummeted. It just, it just doesn't happen. And again, with the caveat, you have to pay them off on time and in full every single month. That's just the, the absolute table stakes for what we're doing here, but it's a great question. Really, genuinely great. Um, in the section about minimum spend on your travel rewards um, 101, you discuss the importance of knowing uh, when the minimum spend must be met. Are there common pitfalls or mistakes that individuals should be aware of when they're managing their spend, minimum spend requirements? Yeah, so, okay. In very general terms, if you think there's any, you're going to have any issue whatsoever hitting that spend, if it's going to come down to a couple of days, then you need to find out precisely when you have until. And just really simply, you just send a, you log into your credit card account and just send a secure message. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the messages that you have and just ask them, Hey, when do I need to hit this spending requirement? And they'll just, they'll lay it out for you very, very clearly. Uh, it's usually even more favorable than if it's usually the first 90 days is what they say in the terms. In my experience, they, it's usually, they usually give you a little more than that. So there is some flexibility, but I think what we all need to be cognizant of is you do not want to open a credit card and miss the minimum spend. Like that's catastrophic because there's a reasonable chance that you might not be able to open that credit card again or might not be able to open it again for a while. So like the Chase Sapphire Preferred, you can only get that, that bonus every 48 months. So if you've screwed this, well, actually, it's interesting. I, I wonder what the, the the fine print would say if you didn't get the bonus. <laughs> that That's a, a separate issue. But let, let's uh, argue that you wouldn't be able to get that for 48 months. American Express has a once in a lifetime now and I think they define lifetime as seven years, or I think that that's what uh, a lot of people believe. But nevertheless, that's I mean that's a really long time. So you need to take them at the word and say this is a once in a lifetime bonus. So you don't want to miss it in in essence. So uh, again, if it's going to come down to that, and you have the financial wherewithal, right? Like there are easy ways you can buy Amazon gift cards, right? Like if, if it was going to absolutely come down to it, log into your Amazon account buy the necessary amount of gift cards. And then in all likelihood, you're probably going to spend that in the next couple of months or, or in, in some, some quick period of time, you can often, I don't know, I, you can buy gift cards at the grocery store. You could prepay your utility bills or, I mean, I, I don't love doing that kind of stuff, but I mean, Nick, if, if the argument is, Hey, I'm going to miss this. I'm, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to get the bonus. I think you do what you have to do at that point. So, uh, 
do not miss it, but just, just send them a message. Um, let's see. Uh, that's very kind of you, Kelly. I'm glad you like the podcast. Yeah. Let's see, I'm trying to decide which, we've got about 10, it's nine minutes left. So I'm trying to, I'm reading these questions to see which one we can <laughs> wrap up with. Um, okay. Uh, you emphasize the significant value of travel rewards points and how they surpass the actual cash on trips or cash spent on trips. Can you elaborate on how individuals can mentally shift from considering travel expenses and cash terms to understanding the true value and savings achievable through travel rewards points? that too yeah i, I well i'm not 100 <laughs> sure um yeah. can you is there any clarification i think I, I might have missed that let's see um i guess just i guess how would people mentally shift the, i don't know just understanding yeah. the value of this yeah instead yeah. of okay yeah the cash got it, got it, spent on it yeah no and that's that's my fault and 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 actually i'm always like the sober conservative financial person when it when it comes to anything so i actually want to be clear like even the the other way is we call this free or nearly free travel but if you were somebody who really doesn't like to travel or there's uh or you that cash back that you used to get was really important to your financial life or frankly like those Chase Sapphire perform uh, the the points you're going to get the ultimate rewards from Sapphire Preferred, you can actually turn those into cash back. Okay, so uh, that's it's not the it, in fact it's the worst possible way to redeem them in, in my estimation, but that doesn't mean or let me rephrase it's the least valuable way. It's not the worst way because that that's actually precisely the point here is every person needs to figure out what works for them. Right. So Nick, when you are using 60,000 points, if you're basically fabricating travel because that you don't really want to take, or you weren't going to, I mean, you could have had $600 in cold, hard cash for those 60,000 points. So that's just the simple concept of opportunity cost, right? So what am I giving up? You're actually giving up $600 in that case. So if you actually, and that's why uh, my friend Zach, who has that Travel Freely site, has a site called Cash Freely. And you can actually, if you were interested in finding quick links to those, uh, choosefi.com slash freely, so F-R-E-E-L-Y, it'll take you to a, a link to sign up for both of them. But there's a reasonable case to be made to go for cash back. I mean, I think, again, value-wise, like I said, I think at minimum you can turn those ultimate rewards points into, well, at the very minimum, 1.25 cents per point. So 25% more value just by simply booking through the Chase travel portal, right? So that's just a search engine. It's like using Travelocity or Kayak. There's no award limitations. There's no blackheads. There's no nothing. That's 25% more value. So that's a no brainer if you travel is your thing. But like I just use for this trip to Texas, I got three cents per point. I've done a lot better than that on on other reward redemptions, but I think you can roughly say two cents per point. So instead of getting six hundred dollars, I think that should be twelve hundred dollars. So, but am I going to blame you if you if you turn that into cash and deposit in your bank and and laughed all the way to the bank? No, of course not. That that works for you, right? So I think I think that's probably like from a mental mindset. I would say that opportunity cost is actually the thing that we need to be most aware of. But yeah, I mean, listen, th this is a really great way, Travel Rewards, to take one of the most expensive line items in your budget, which is travel. I mean, I, I, I don't want to speak for everyone on this call or, or, or listening to the, the recording, but most of us love to travel, right? And it costs a lot of money. And if you tell me, hey, if I can build some flexibility into my life and let the points take me where they will as opposed to trying to shoehorn them into very precise travel on very precise dates, I can see the world for pennies. And that feels really, really good. And, you know, I guess the way that my co-host on the podcast, Jonathan, always like to look at it, I, 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 this doesn't really resonate with me, but I know it does with so many people. It's like, you are paying for travel normally with after-tax dollars. So that $5,000 trip is actually... 
I don't know, seven or eight or maybe 9,000, depending on what kind of uh, marginal tax bracket and, and state you live on of your gross income. So, Hey, I make 80 grand in my, in my job. Well, I just spent eight of that gross on this $5,000 trip. So I think that might be the mental way of looking at it is, Oh, wow. So this would have been $8,000 of my salary. And by being flexible and accumulating these points over six, 12, 18 months, you mean I can take that trip for a hundred bucks? Like, I mean, Nick, I'm entirely convinced you with the flexibility can take a, easily a week long trip to Italy for a couple hundred dollars. And I think anyone on this call can take, if you planned out nine to 18 months, you could easily take a nearly free trip to Europe or Asia with just some planning. Like, I think it's pretty easy, but it it's a stepwise process. It's not, hey, we're going to Japan next month. Again, you could open the venture card. You could save four or 500 bucks, which is great. That's fine. But if you wanted this thing for free, you want to stay in that Park Hyatt in New York City or in Tokyo that you've always dreamed of. All right, well, then I need to open up either a Hyatt card or Chase Ultimate Rewards. I can transfer them to Hyatt. And yeah, it's going to cost me 30,000 points a night as opposed to my little Hyatt place in Dallas, Fort Worth or Arlington. But to stay in a $1,200 a night park hotel, park, park Hyatt overlooking Tokyo, yeah, that's not too shabby, right? So it allows you the ability to travel in luxury that a lot of us might not otherwise do. And I think, I think for international travel, even though it costs a lot more points to travel business or certainly first class, but I mean, to get one of those live flat seats on a 14 hour trip to Tokyo or Shanghai or, or something. And instead of it being 60,000 miles round trip, it being a hundred or 120, like, yeah, that's not too shabby for a trip of a lifetime. So it, it enables you to think a little bit differently. So yeah, Nick, I, I know I touched on a lot there. I, I'm confident I answered your question, or at least I, I hope I am. <laughs> you did. Thank you. And with that, we are pretty much out of time. So I'm going to go ahead and take the moment to thank you, Brad. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope that everyone enjoyed um, tonight's session. Um, and let us know if you want more sessions like this. You can send us an email at alumni at richmond.edu. Um, be sure to check out our website um, to find more exciting events that we have um, all around the United States um, and some internationally, few, but some. Um, and certainly be sure to check out the Choose FI podcast.